morning, Your Honor. My name is John Skreska, and I'm on behalf of the prosecutor. Judge, please, the court. Mitchell Bittler on behalf of Tucker Cipriano. Your Honor. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This morning, um, Mr. Rivitwer and I had an opportunity to talk, and this, he informed me that uh, Mr. Cipriano wanted to tender a plea of uh, either nolo or guilty to uh, first degree felony murder, which carries a, a mandatory uh, life without parole sentence. Um, the, um, there was no exchange, no quid pro quo in, in this case. This is not a plea bargain. But Mr. Cipriano, was, uh, if he does tender a plea this, morning, this afternoon and the court does accept it, that would make the trial of the remainder of these charges uh, sort of moot at this point because the, uh, any kind of sentence that the court would give on the assault murder charges or on the uh, armed robbery charge would be subsumed by the uh, life without parole sentence that goes along with the first degree felony murder. So. There is no plea bargain in this case, uh, but as I said, if he does tend to the plea and you do accept it, it will make the trial of the rest of these matters moot at this time. However, the people do uh, reserve their right uh, to amend the charges should there be any physical changes in the people that suffered in the assault murder cases, uh, specifically Rosemary Cipriano and Salvatore Cipriano. Should there, uh, their uh, medical conditions change, which necessitates uh, rewriting the charges in this case. We reserve the right to do that, and Mr. Cipriano should know that he pleads at his own peril for that. Your Honor, again, please, the court, Mitchell Rivera. Uh, the statements of Mr. Skrinsky are accurate. There is no plea bargain or plea agreement with the prosecutor's office. Uh, Mr. Cipriano is uh, freely and voluntarily going to enter a plea of no contest to count two, that is felony murder. Um, and obviously should the court accept that plea, then whatever the prosecutor's office decides to do is on the prosecutor's office. Uh, the record should reflect that uh, Tucker and I have discussed this matter at length. We've talked about it on numerous occasions, not just this morning. Um, we spent hours together. This is his choice. I've tried to uh, discuss with them both the pros and cons of what's uh, going on at in the trial and the pros and cons of him going forward and pleading to felony murder. And if I may, I'm asking permission of the court that I be allowed to voir dire Mr. Cipriano before you take the plea so we can put certain things on the record to make sure that he's clear with what he's doing and there's no issue with respect to the court having to accept the plea if that's what the court chooses to do. State your name, please. Um, Tucker Roberts again. Okay. Tucker, you and I have been involved in this case since uh, really shortly after April 15th of 2012. Is that correct? Yes. And we've consulted with each other over the course of the last uh, little over a year, correct? Yes. And in the last couple of weeks, you came to me and you talked about potentially entering a, a plea uh, to the charges containing the information that are pending against you. Is that correct? Yes. And you and I uh, talked about what the government would have to do to prove the case. They'd have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. You're presumed innocent, and you don't have to do anything. The obligation is on them to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Yes. And prove your guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Yes. Do you understand that? Yep. Okay. You also understand, should you enter a plea of either no contest or guilty to the charge of first-degree felony murder, that you will go to prison for the rest of your life. Yes, sir. You will not be paroled. Yes, sir. You will die in prison. Yes, sir. The only way you'll get out of prison is if the President of the United States gives you a pardon or the governor commutes your sentence. You understand that? Yes, sir. And the chances of that happening are probably slim to none. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so you're willing to accept the rest of your life in prison and take a plea? Yes, sir. You and I have gone through your constitutional statutory rights. Is that correct? Yeah. You filled out a form. Yeah. You understand you have a right to have a trial. Yeah. Trial by jury. Yeah. That you're presumed innocent unless the prosecutor can prove you're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah. That any witnesses against you, you can confront, look at them, have me or you cross-examine them. 
Yep. Any witnesses you want? The judges subpoena them? Okay. All right? Yep. Okay, you want to give up all the rights that are contained in that particular document. Yeah. Has anybody forced you to do this? No. Has anybody uh, coerced you and said you have to do this? No. Is this your own free choice? Yes, it is. You understand if you're sitting in prison and 10 years from now, you say, gee, I shouldn't have done this, or you know, why did my lawyer talk me out of it? You're stuck. Yeah. You're there. Yeah. And you want to go forward. Yeah. And nothing further. All right, Mr. Sipper, I'll just wander over. I'll ask you to state your name again, please. Dr. Robert Sipper. How old are you? Can you read, write, and understand the English language? I can. Can you hear and understand me? Yes. Could you hear and understand your attorney? Yes. Are you satisfied with the advice he's giving you? I am. Do you understand that you are pleading guilty to homicide, felony murder? Yes. Do you know that your sentence will be life without parole? Yes. Do you understand that you are right to have your own lawyer represent you from start to finish, including trial, sentence, and appeal, and a lawyer will be appointed for you to have a fourth? Yes. Do you understand your right to a trial by jury? Stand for the trial, you are presumed innocent unless the prosecutor proves you're guilty on a reasonable doubt. Okay. You understand that you have right to have all the witnesses against you appear at trial and have your lawyer ask the witnesses questions and the judge order any witnesses you might have to appear at the trial. Yes, ma'am. You understand that you don't have to testify at trial and nobody can say anything about it. you're not testifying or holding against you. Another man, you do have a right to testify at trial if you want to testify. Okay. You understand that if I accept your plea, you will not have a trial at any time. You'll be giving up all these rights I told you about. Any claim for the plea was a result of promises and threats that were not disclosed to the court. And that it was not your choice to plead. You understand all of that? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand that any appeal from the conviction and sentence following the plea will be by application for leave to appeal and not by right? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand that a plea means you have a convic conviction and may be used against you in the future? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand that your probation or parole is plea could affect your status? Yes, ma'am. Has anyone threatened you to get you to plead? No, ma'am. Is it your own choice to plead? Yes, ma'am. The factual basis? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, I have several pieces that I'd like to offer into evidence of the factual basis of this matter. Um, first of all, I would like to just indicate that uh, Mr. Rabitwer and I have talked about the case, and I know that Mr. Rabitwer, and pursuant to our prior pretrial conferences with this court, too, that Mr. Rabitwer did investigate possible defenses, and I'm sure he's discussed those with Mr. Cipriano, but I know we have. That is true, Judge. We have, we have uh, obviously looked at uh, potential sanity defenses. Mr. Cipriano has referred to Forensic Center. We have an opinion on that. He is competent to stand trial. He is uh, not insane. He's doing this freely and voluntarily. He understands it. We've talked about some other issues that I'm not going to put on the record. But I only have one question, if I may ask him. Right. Mr. Cipriano, you're not under the influence of any mind-altering chemicals right now, are you? No. No alcohol, no drugs. No. Last time you had any mind altering chemicals would have been on April 15th of 2012. Yes, sir. Give us with a clear mind and clear head. Yes. Thank you, Judge. And Your Honor, I'd also like Mr. Uh, Rabitwer's assurance that he is satisfied after speaking with Mr. Cipriano that his <coughs> client is making an informed choice. I am. As I say on the record, Judge, I spent many hours with Tucker talking about this, and this is his free choice, and I, and I believe that. It's voluntary, intelligent, and knowing we're done. Your Honor, I would also uh, ask that the, the court, I believe the court said that he was going to plead guilty. Did I say guilty? Yeah, yes. I think I'm so. Sorry, I meant to say no. no. And secondly, uh, that the minimum sentence in this matter is the same as the maximum, which is life without parole. And I wish that if the court would please instruct uh, the defendant as to the minimum as well, just for the record. Oh, the sentence is life without parole. It's the maximum, it's the minimum, it's the same. That's right. All right, Your Honor, uh, at this time I would like to uh, uh, enter a few things into the, uh, the court's record as uh, exhibits. And I will start with uh, exhibits numbers one and two, which are the two volumes of the preliminary exam held in this matter uh, on May the 24th and June the 8th of 2012. I would offer those as exhibit number one and two. And I would simply indicate to the court at this time that the same, I, uh, the salient part of that was Mr. Zinderman's testimony during the course of the exam, and uh, I'm exerting the following statements that he made under oath. He uh, was asked at the beginning of March, or the end of March, the beginning of April 2012, if you remember being at the home of uh, one James Williams, and Mr. Zimmerman, uh, Zinderman indicated the following. I recall Tucker being there, Roderick, who was uh, Mitchell Young, uh, and they're having a discussion with Mr. Cipriano that day. He said it was about they might be doing a job for money. 
they was talking about possibly hurting a family or killing a family. Uh, and I, was, I asked him, who was it that said they were thinking about killing a family? He said, I remember Tucker saying it. I think Roderick was present at the time. Tucker was offering me some money to help out, be the getaway driver, or possibly helping cover up. I was supposed to get a share of the money. I think it might have been one third. Tucker Cipriano was estimating about three grand. I would take home $1,000. And then again later, Mr. Zinderman continued to testify, and he spoke about a meeting on the night uh, that this happened. It was between April the 15th of 2012 and April the 16th of 2012. Uh, they were at a, a mobile gas station, and this was now on, I believe it was uh, in the late evening hours, like just about midnight on the 15th. And they're all in the car, and um, they were uh, talking about uh, what they were going to do at that point to get money. And I believe at this point. Mr. Zinnemann had left the truck where they were, both Mr. Uh, Cipriano and Mr. Young were, and he came back to the truck. He said, I go back to the truck when I'm done having a cigarette. Are they at the truck? Mm -hmm. Answer, yes. They are talking. It was how they were going to get money. Both of them were talking. They decided on going to the Cipriano's house and killing them, killing the family. They were talking about which family member should be taken care of, who would take care of which family members by killing them. It was decided that Tucker was to go after his two brothers and Roderick was going to go after uh, the mom and dad. And Roderick was supposed to go for the sister, from what I understand. Roderick said he was going to kill the mother and father? Yes. Tucker said he would kill the brothers? Yes. It was discussed that the father was going to be go to go first, to get killed first, because he was bigger and more of a threat. And the question was, they were both discussing it. He said they were planning on weighing the bodies down with barrels and throwing them in the river, the Detroit River. They were planning on, after the killing was done, taking the cars and objects of value that they can get money off of. Tucker wanted to run away to Mexico. They were going to sell the cars. There was talk about that and live off the money. Uh, I asked, was it immediately decided that they were going to kill the Cipriano family? The answer was no. They were debating about the Hodge family. This is the neighbor. They didn't have as much money as the Ciprianos had. So they decided the Ciprianos were better than the Hodges? Answer, yes. Uh, and then he went on to say, I said, they want to fuck up their life. They can do it on their own accord. Don't bring me into it. He then asked them to drop them off at a house in Kegel Harbor, which they did. Uh, I would also, and that's uh, exhibits numbers one and two, uh, I, would, I would also uh, ask for admission of exhibit number three, which is the statement that was given the night of the homicide by Isabella Cipriano at the um, Farmington Hills Police Department. She was taken from the scene where she had actually witnessed uh, some of the, uh, the things go down, and she told the, the police this. She said, so this is the story. So I woke up and I went downstairs and I saw this boy pounding my mom, my mom, with a bat, and Tucker was there too. Tucker said, go back upstairs, but I did. I went downstairs. And then my mom and he, he she, she said, you, you can take my purse. But then I went around and hid the purse so they wouldn't take it, so they wouldn't find it and take it. And, um, and then I went back upstairs. And Tucker said to go downstairs, but I didn't want to. So, but then he's carrying me downstairs. Uh, Salvatore, that's the, one of the victims in this case, he was upstairs, and Tucker went to, get his, went to get him to get his BB gun. And then Salvatore was on the floor, and he was trying to step on the BB gun. And I got my bat. I was trying to get Tucker, but then Tucker took my bat and started to pound Tor, that's Salvatore, and my mom with the other kid. And then the whole thing... They went downstairs, and then after that, um, the police came. After a while, after that, the police came. That was uh, a statement of Isabella, and that's exhibit number three. And exhibit number four was a statement that was given the night of the murders, April the 16th, at the Farmington Hills Police Station by Tanner Cipriano. And uh, he said uh, he was being questioned by one of the detectives, and he was on the phone. Uh, he was concealed under a desk. He was on the phone to 911. And he said, yeah, I talked to the lady for about a couple of minutes, and then he runs in. Tucker ran into the room. What was Tucker wearing? He was 
I still had, the light was off, was off. It was all dark, and so he runs into the room. Was he wearing dark clothes? Answer, yeah. Did it look like the same clothes you seen the guy with the bat? I didn't get a good look. Okay, uh, are you positive it was Tucker at this point? Yeah. He was looking. He was talking as he was looking for me. He was yelling back to his friend. He was like, there's one more, there's one more. So first he came in looking on like the bed and stuff. Didn't find me. So he ran back outside and started breaking more stuff. I don't know what he was doing, but I was still on the phone with the operator. Okay, then he came back in. Yeah, came back in a couple of minutes later, and he brought a lighter to look under the bed. Okay, and he was looking under the bed at the time? Yeah. And lighting it up with a lighter? Yeah. And you heard him say, there's one more, one more? Yeah. He was yelling back at his friend like, yeah, like, look everywhere. Did he say look everywhere? Yeah. There's one more. Now you say he found you eventually? No, he didn't. That was a statement given that night by Tanner. That's exhibit number four. Exhibit number five uh, is an excerpt from the uh, interview that was taken of Mr. Cipriano himself, Tucker Cipriano, on April the 16th uh, by Detective Webby and Detective McDonald at the Farmington Hills Police Station. And in pertinent part, uh, they were talking to him about what happened after they had entered the house. And he had gotten in, he said he had gotten in through a window and he had let uh, Mr. Young in through a door. And at that point, he was attacked by uh, a family dog and it awakened the people in the house. And his father then came into the kitchen. And the detective says, so your dad comes down, he tells you guys to leave. You take a step to go leave and then a fight breaks out? And Mr. Cipriano says, yeah, because I look behind me and my dad, all I see is my dad like right, I, here's the door right by the kitchen where they're walking in. Here's that door to the outside where Roderick, and Roderick is Mitchell Young, uh, was hiding over in the corner under the coats and shit. And my parents are walking down here. Question, did your dad see Roderick at this point? Uh, apparently he did because when I turned around, he's like, over here, looking like this over in the corner. And I'm like, I knew something was gonna happen when I was at, when he was like, get the hell out of my house. Then it turned bad. At this point he says, so first, the first part of the fight was more physical or did Roderick come out from behind with the baseball bat swinging? And Mr. Tuck, and Mr. Cipriano says, I don't think he ever hit him with just the bat. Okay, and you grabbed your dad? And Mr. Cipriano says, yeah. And he started hitting him in the head, and Mr. Tucker, and Mr. Cipriano says, yeah. And he hit him a bunch of times, and Mr. Cipriano says, a bunch, a bunch. And then the detectives ask, when did he fall? Your dad fall? Did he hit him while he was on the ground or just while he was standing? And Mr. Cipriano replies, I think he hit him on the ground too. The final exhibit is exhibit number six, and it's the autopsy of Robert Cipriano that was done by Dr. Ortiz Reyes uh, on the following day, that is April the uh, 17th of 2012, and that is Exhibit 6 here. And uh, under evidence of injury of head and neck, Dr. Uh, Ortiz Reyes describes many, many injuries to Mr. Cipriano, including a linear fracture of the head extending from the right parietal to the occipital bone to the left parietal. So the skull is cracked all the way across the back. There is a fragmented fracture of the left side of the head, including the left parietal and occipital bones. There are multiple fractures of both anterior and close up of the skull. That's the part uh, above the eyes. Um, this, uh, Dr. Uh, Ortiz Reyes also uh, documents uh, brain bleeding, uh, and several lacerations to the scalp. And he ends his opinion by saying, Robert Cipriano, a 52-year-old white male, died of multiple blunt force head trauma sustained when he was assaulted by another person <coughs> or persons. There was no natural disease contributing to his death. In considering of the consideration of the circumstances of this death, autopsy findings and toxicological analysis, the manner of death is homicide. So all those things, uh, Your Honor, uh, I would submit to the court, exhibits one through six, and the summaries that I gave to the court to as a factual basis for Mr. Cipriano's plea of no contender aid to first degree felony murder, which carries a uh, life sentence without the possibility of parole. 
You know, with permission of uh, Mr. Cipriano, I, I am stipulating to those exhibits as a factual basis for your honor to take the plea. That's right, Mr. Cipriano? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. On that stipulation and the facts laid out by the prosecutor, they accept that factual basis and the proper factual basis for a no-contest plea of felony murder. So both sides satisfied with taking the plea? Yes. Your Honor, I'll just ask that the court inquire why it is appropriate at this point to take a no-contest plea. Civil liability, it's obvious. Thank you. Your Honor, I would just, for the record, state that I'm going to wait until the sentencing date when the court has sentenced Mr. Cipriano to, at that point, dismiss the remaining charges without prejudice. Yes, it's his discretion, Judge, whatever he wants to do. Your Honor, also, Mr. Rivera and I spoke at length before this plea occurred, and we agreed that there would be continuing order as the court had in place before the plea regarding statements by witnesses, and both Mr. Rivera and the prosecutor's office have agreed to also be bound by that same order, which prevents any type of extrajudicial statements during the pendency of the matter related to Mitchell Young. And we have stipulated to the wording of an order which I have submitted to the court, and we are jointly asking that that order be entered. So stipulated, Judge. Okay, so the order that I entered into on both cases, this matter as well as defendant Mitchell Young's case, was the same order applying to all witnesses and parties that they are not to be making any out-of-court statements. That order stands as Mitchell Young's case is still ongoing. So as to those witnesses, it's the same witnesses that were named in both cases. Those witnesses and those parties are not to make any out-of-court statements as was ordered before. This order now by stipulation of the attorneys in this matter is going to extend to the attorneys of record in this matter. So therefore, the attorneys of record in this matter are also not to make any out-of-court statements to anybody until the Mitchell Young case is concluded. I will sign that order. And, Your Honor, for the record, I am satisfied that this court has complied with the rule. I am also, and I already said that. I'll say it again. Anything else for the record? I think that's it. Okay. Thank you. Please rise. Please be seated.